This is your host Andre again. Is the book of Revelation a closed book for you? Just use the correct keys and you will have the wonderful experience of understanding the messages of Revelation. Francois will help you unlock this treasure of life-changing messages. Welcome to a tremendous experience in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. The main theme of this great apocalyptic book is Jesus Christ. In chapters 4 and 5 you meet God the Father and His Son in a unique manner in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. We are going to discover Jesus in a dynamic way in the symbolism of the white horse. This horse is followed by three others, a red one, black one and a pale one. The four horses represent the first four seals. Then we have the fifth seal that tells us more about the martyrs crying out from under the altar because of religious persecution. When the sixth seal is opened, there is a horrific earthquake, followed by a mysterious darkness and the falling of stars. What is the meaning of the seals? The Bible will have to give us its own interpretation. And of course, Jesus is the very best interpreter of the prophecies of the book of Revelation. We are going to ask him to explain to us the meaning of the seven seals in the light of his Olivet Discourse which we find in Matthew 24. On the slopes of the Mount of Olives, Jesus gave one of the greatest prophetic sermons on end-time events. In a masterly manner, he links the books of Daniel and Revelation. Listen as he explains. Matthew 24 verse 3 As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said. When will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? When one examines the work of the rider on the white horse, you will notice a remarkable similarity to what Jesus said in Matthew 24 verse 14. Let's read it. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Both Matthew 24 verse 14 and the rider of the white horse have the proclamation of the gospel at heart. While Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, he looked down the stream of time and saw the terrible calamities that would afflict our planet. Verse 7 Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines causing the death of millions. He wept when he saw the bubonic epidemic of the Middle Ages sending millions to their graves. He wept when he saw the AIDS epidemic of our day. He wept when he saw what is happening to you. It is not God who brings these curses upon us, but the disobedience of man. If the world had heeded the gospel message of the rider on the white horse, it would never have reaped the results of the red, black and pale horses. Verse 21 says, For then there will be great distress, unequaled, from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Can we link this prophecy to one of the seals? Yes. Can we link it to the book of Daniel? Yes. We find a tragic parallel in the sixth seal where the blood of the martyrs cries to the Lord for revenge. But Jesus also links his prophetic message to the book of Daniel. We read in Daniel chapter 7.25 of the persecution of the saints that would last for a time, times and half a time, a total of 1,260 years. History tells us that papal supremacy and persecution began in 538 AD and ended in 1798. What did Jesus predict would happen towards the close of this period? Verse 29, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Historians tell us that the last official papal persecution happened in 1776. Let's see whether all these celestial signs are mentioned in the prophecy of the seven seals. When the sixth seal opened, the great prophetic clock of Matthew 24-29 struck. On May 19, 1780, a mysterious darkness settled over the earth. 
Shortly after November 13, 1833, the world saw a meteoric shower as never before. What a marvellous harmony between the prediction of Jesus and that of John. What is next? Matthew 24, 30 At that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky. Can we link this climactic event to one of the seals? Yes, we can. We find a perfect parallel in Revelation 6, 14-16 where it says that the skies of heaven will roll back and Jesus the mighty King will come and take us home. Matthew 24 verse 31 tells us that the angels will gather the elect. This prophecy finds a parallel in the seventh seal when there will be silence in heaven. But why? Because all the angels will accompany Jesus at his second coming. Bible study, prayer and witnessing helped millions of martyrs to die for their faith in Jesus. The book of Revelation predicts that God's children will again be persecuted before he takes them home at last. Let us spend more time reading the Bible, more time on our knees and more time witnessing about God's love and kindness towards us. Revelation chapter 5 verses 1 to 5 Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. I'm so glad that Jesus is able and willing to open this prophetic scroll or book and explain its contents. He is also able and willing to open and explain the mysterious record of your sin, your pain and mine. Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder Come and see And I looked and behold a white horse He who sat on it had a bow And a crown was given to him And he went out conquering and to conquer who is this triumphant rider on the pure white horse? Revelation 19.11 answers, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Only Jesus is true and faithful and the bow and crown are symbols of victory. He is galloping to every defeated sinner saying, Give me your heart and I will make you more than a conqueror. When the ancient world rejected the message of the rider on the white horse, they reaped the results thereof. May God help us to learn from history and accept the gospel message and thereby escape the consequences of disobedience. And now for the events that accompanied the second horse. Revelation 6 verses 3 and 4. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that the people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. The red horse represents the terrible results of rejecting the gospel message. The red of heresy and persecution became rife in the Roman Empire. An estimated 80,000 Jews were massacred in the Colosseum alone. Had they accepted the message of the rider on the white horse, this would never have happened. The message of the red horse invites us to allow Christ to transform us into kind people in order to avoid unnecessary persecution. And should we be persecuted, it should only be because of our faith in Christ Jesus. Let's move on to the events that transpired during the opening of the third seal. 
Revelation chapter 6 verses 5 and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked and behold a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. So much money for so little food. What could be the meaning of the balances or scales in this vision? The prophet tells us that commas entered the church. Salvation not by grace, but salvation by money. You're looking at Tokyo, where you can expect to find weighing instruments in these businesses, but John sees them in a religious setting. Why? Because during the Dark Ages, the commas of selling relics, like the skull of Bethlehemy, entered the church. These relics include a rib of Peter, a bone of Timothy's leg, pieces of Daniel and two stones thrown at Stephen. A very dark period is represented by a dark horse. People bought this piece of bone belonging to Andrew, thinking it would make them holy. The price paid for this piece of Philip's arm bone and portion of Matthew's skull could not bring them salvation. People believed that if they possessed this relic of the cross of Christ, they could earn God's favour. Truth is that we can only earn his favour by accepting the gift of his son. John saw a black rider holding a pair of balances representing people who wanted to buy salvation through human effort. This always happens when pride prevents one from accepting God's free gift of salvation. Let's listen to the events that transpired during the opening of the fourth seal. Revelation chapter 6 verses 7 and 8 So I looked and behold a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death and Hades followed him. And power was given them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The time slot of the pale horse stretches from 538, when the papacy was officially established, until 1563 AD. At the Council of Trent in 1563, the Catholic Church officially rejected the Bible truths of the Reformation. What a fitting symbol, a pale horse, the color of death. It was during this period that the spiritually dead church martyred millions upon millions of so-called heretics. This always happens when people reject the softening effect of the gospel upon their lives. The Waldensian valleys in northern Italy are soaked with the blood of martyrs. When I visited this historic site, I thought of the prophecy of the pale horse. The Franschhoek monument was erected in honour of the Huguenots who fled the Catholic persecution in France. You are looking at a monument to the fulfilment of the prophecy of the fourth seal, the Pale Horse. When one reads the history of the time of the Pale Horse, the fourth seal, you can appreciate the terrible agonising cries coming from the fifth seal. Allegorically, we hear the saints crying out for justice. Revelation chapter 6, 9 to 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was complete. In our previous lecture on the seven churches, we visited Bunhill Fields in London, where John Bunyan was also buried with many others who were persecuted by the mainland Protestant churches. And now, under the fifth seal, we are listening to the allegorical cry of all these martyrs wanting to know how long this persecution would last. The answer comes in verse 11. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. 
In the book of Revelation, we will learn more about this final persecution. Don't miss these lectures. It's important to know who will be persecuted by whom. And now for the dramatic events of the sixth seal. Revelation 6, 12 and 13 says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. Was there really a disastrous earthquake when the sixth seal was opened? Did the sun darken? And did the moon turn red? Did the stars really fall from heaven? The earthquake mentioned in this seal was the Great Lisbon Earthquake of November 1, 1755. It was one of the most extensive and severe disturbances ever experienced. By the way, the Inquisition, that much dreaded persecuting machine, had its headquarters at Lisbon. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. Was this prediction also fulfilled? Yes, it was. In 1880, a large 720-page volume was published entitled The Great Events of Our Past Century. This monumental volume describes the most important events that occurred in America during each of the first 100 years of its history. The event reported for 1780 was the mysterious dark day. Quotes, Almost if not altogether alone as the most mysterious and yet unexplained phenomenon of its kind, in nature's diversified range of events during the last century stands the dark day of May 19, 1780. Altogether nine pages are devoted to a description of this strange occurrence. The darkness began at 10 and 11 in the morning and continued through the day. Chickens went to roost as the candles were lit. The report says that this darkness was not caused by an eclipse as manifested by the various positions of the planetary bodies at that time, for the moon was more than 150 degrees from the sun all that day. This phenomenon cannot be explained scientifically. God was giving the world a sure sign that he was just about on his way to come and rescue his suffering children. Revelation 6.12 The whole moon turned blood red. That night the darkness was impenetrable, like the plague of darkness that befell the ancient Egyptians. People were shocked at the appearance of a blood red moon. What's going to happen next? Verse 13 And the stars in the sky fell to the earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. Was this prediction fulfilled? Yes. Page 2 to 8 of our past century devotes eight pages to this event. Chapter 28 is entitled Sublime Meteoric Shower All Over the United States, 1833. It is referred to as the most grand and brilliant phenomenon ever beheld and recorded by man. Extensive and magnificent showers of shooting stars have been known to occur at various places in modern times. But the most universal and wonderful which has ever been recorded is that of the 13th of November, 1833. The whole firmament, all over the United States, being then for hours in fiery commotion. On page 2 to 9, the writer reports, To form some idea of such a spectacle, one must imagine a constant succession of the fireballs resembling skyrockets radiating in all directions from a point in the heavens near the zenith and following the arch of the sky towards the horizon. It is significant to note that the prophet Joel as well as the prophet John predicted that these celestial signs would appear as a sign of his soon return. While John was still enthralled by this heavenly display of falling stars, a still brighter heavenly scene suddenly almost blinded his sight. Guess what it was? 
Revelation 6.14 The sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Do you realize that we are living in serious times, exciting times? We are living between the events mentioned in verse 13, the falling of stars, and verse 14, which describes the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ in the skies. On that day the lost will cry to the rocks to hide them. The saved will rejoice because of the final deliverance from their rock of ages, Jesus Christ. Revelation 6.15 Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Verse 16 They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who can stand? What a contrast between the lost hiding under the rocks and the allegorical souls under the altar. What a difference between the cry of the wicked to the mountains and the rocks to destroy them and the prayer of the martyrs to the rock of their salvation. Before John tells us about the seventh seal, he devotes an entire chapter to the qualities of the saved, those who will survive the glory of the second coming of Christ. Revelation chapter 7 verse 4 Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Please don't miss the next lecture on the meaning of the seal and the 144,000. You and I may be one of them. We have opened six seals and looked at their accurate fulfillment. And now for the grand climax, the second coming of Christ. Soon, very soon, you and I will stop crying. Soon, very soon, we will enter a state of eternal undisturbed happiness. Revelation chapter 8 verse 1 When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Why? Matthew 24 verse 30 explains. At that time the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Where will the angels be at this time? Matthew 24 verse 31 And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from the one end of the heavens to the other. When Jesus comes to fetch you and me, heaven will be empty. Why? All the angels will come down with Christ to welcome us home. On that day we are going to meet our guardian angels. What a thought! Can you imagine this heavenly, glorious armada moving majestically through the vast universe on their way to our planet, the planet where Jesus died for the sins of mankind? Can you imagine the joy in Christ's heart on that day, should you be ready to go home with him? Can you imagine the thrill of moving up into space with an immortal body, forever released of our sinful natures? Can you imagine life without a struggle? A life without temptations? A life without tears and pain? What must you and I do to go to heaven when Jesus comes a second time? Well, it's actually very simple. First of all, we have to confess our lostness and accept the fact that Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. Then we must thank him for the gift of forgiveness and salvation he offers us. We should allow him daily, hourly, to make us kind, courteous and considerate. It is my desire to be ready when he comes. Is it your desire as well? Lord, please remove our hearts of stone and replace them with hearts of flesh. Amen. The next few lectures will help you to understand Revelation as never before. Don't miss it.